Hi, my name is Reverend Rick Brown and welcome to St. James United Church in Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. It's good to be back with you in worship today and good to have you here with us uh, joining us in worship today as I was off last week and I wanna thank Sandra Litt who led our worship team while I was away last week. Um, and thank you also to uh, Rick and Sophia for their musical contributions to the service last week. And thank you uh, also for Sophia who edited the worship service, uh, the worship video last week. I wanna thank all of those who, uh, who helped out and today is Pentecost Sunday, which is the beginning of a new season in the Christian calendar. It's the end of the Easter season and the celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit. As it's the first Sunday in a new church season, that also means that it's a communion Sunday. So if you haven't got your bread and juice ready yet, then uh, just push pause on the video and run to the kitchen now. Uh, grab yourself a slice of bread uh, and a small glass of juice or anything resembling bread or juice that you can use as a substitute, even cracker and water will be fine. Uh, anything like that is good. And bring it back here, uh, unpause the video and continue in worship with us. And now let us continue in singing and praise. Let go of me. 
Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 4, and it is the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Let us listen for the Word of God. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And our second reading today comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. And this is the description of the fruits of the Spirit. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you're uh, out at the grocery store shopping for groceries and you're picking out fruit, how much time do you spend inspecting the fruit to get just the right one? And, and what are you looking for when you're going through the fruit trying to find the right one for you? What are you, what are you looking for when you're picking fruit? How do you know the good ones from the bad ones? Or when was the last time you actually picked fruit off a tree or a vine? How do you know the good fruit from the rotten fruit when you're picking it off the tree or the vine? What do you look for to tell the difference? Well, you can usually tell by looking at it. If it's, if, for example, if it's brown and squishy, it's probably not very good to eat. And the same principle applies to the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the day we celebrate God's gift to us of the Holy Spirit. We remember the story of the day the Spirit was poured out on Jesus' disciples. It's easy to get caught up in the, the kind of magical qualities of this story. The disciples were, were gathered in a house and, and then there was a sound like a violent rushing wind. Have you ever experienced a violent rushing wind? I mean, we get some pretty decent storms around here in Southern Ontario. What's the worst wind you've ever experienced personally? I know for me, I remember the, the worst one I experienced was living through a tornado, tornado when I was about 16, a teenager anyway. I was over at my girlfriend's house and, and there was a big storm brewing. And I was looking out the living room window at the front of the house and I noticed across the street, above the house, or directly across the street, I noticed something that was floating in the air above the neighbor's house. And it was a shingle as I got a better look at it, and it was, it was spinning. And, and I, without thinking about what I was seeing or saying, I just was kind of narrating out loud what I was seeing across the street, watching this shingle spinning in the air. And as soon as I said these things, fortunately my girlfriend's mother had the presence of mind to recognize what I was saying and yelled for all of us to head to the basement. And just as we got to the bottom of the basement stairs, the windows on the main floor of the house imploded. We heard the sound of a violent rushing wind in the house. I'll never forget that experience. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, heard the sound of a violent rushing wind in the house with them. That must have been just a wee bit frightening for them. And then after the wind came the flames. Flames appeared in the middle of the room. Now, I've never been 
in a house that was on fire. I've never lived through a house fire, but I have to imagine it must also be pretty, pretty frightening to live through. So first we have a violent rushing wind and now a fire. But the fire, it wasn't, it wasn't burning the room. It was small tongues of fire and they were dancing. And a tongue of fire rested on each of them, on each one of them. And, and again, I, I gotta think that must have been just a little bit frightening. You know, if you've, if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard this Pentecost story read once a year at this time of year, every year for your entire life. You're, you're probably pretty familiar with this story. And if you're new, then this may be a new story for you. But we read it, when we, if for those who are familiar with it, we often, we often read it like it was a really amazing, magical experience. But I have to think if I was to put myself in the shoes of the disciples, it must have been terribly frightening at first. But then they sensed something different about themselves after the wind and the fire. And they began to speak in foreign languages and, and onlookers who were there from various countries could, could understand their different languages. And some people thought they were behaving so weirdly that they thought they were drunk. You know, it sounds kind of cool to be able to spontaneously speak a foreign language that you didn't know before. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. But again, it's easy to get caught up in that kind of quasi-magical nature of this story. But if we stay focused on, on the magic of this story, then it really doesn't have any relevance to us today. Because I, I'll be honest, I haven't met a single person in my life who has experienced the Holy Spirit in their lives in the way described in this story. I don't know anybody who's been sitting there in, engulfed in wind and, a, tra and, and a, 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 a dancing flame and speaking foreign language that they never spoke before. I've never experienced anybody who's lived through all of that. There are some who claim to have spontaneous language utterances, but in general, it's not a very common experience. Certainly not the wind and the fire. And that's why I don't want to dwell too long on the magical story of Pentecost itself. Instead, what I want to focus on today are the effects of the coming of the Holy Spirit, the effects of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the effects of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because I think that's something that is way more relatable to us today than this magical story. So what if you have God's Spirit in you? So what? So you've got God's Spirit in you. So what? What does it mean? If it doesn't have practical, life-changing impact on your life, then what's its importance? And that's where our second passage today comes in. It talks about the fruits of the Spirit. If you have God's Spirit within you, then it'll be visible in the fruits of your life and how you live your life, how you talk, how you act. Just like we can tell the difference between a good and a bad fruit in the grocery store or in the orchard, you can also tell by the fruits of a person's actions whether or not the Spirit of God is driving their heart, whether the Spirit that drives them in their actions is a spirit of love or a spirit of fear and hate. The, the letter to the Galatian church is is where our second reading comes from. And it tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. And it names them love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, there are, there are some churches that teach that this list is complete, exhaustive, and comprehensive. 
There's nothing to be added to it, nothing to be taken away from it. And honestly, I don't agree with that. I, I think it's a much better way to understand this list as a bunch of examples. For instance, these are the kinds of things that are fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit include such things as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, if God's Spirit is in your heart, then people who know you or meet you will see evidence of it in your life. They will see that your heart is filled with love. They'll see this in your actions. They'll hear it in your words. They'll see you live a life filled with joy. There is joy in your heart. Your life brings joy to other people. Being in your presence is an experience of joy. If the Spirit is in your heart, you will be a person of peace. When there is conflict around you, you will seek to be a peaceful presence in the face of that conflict. You will be a calming influence on others. You'll be a bridge builder and a fence mender. You'll help other people hear each other. You'll be patient. You'll be able to wait for things. You'll be slow to react. You'll be able to keep your cool in the face of anxiety. You'll be less inclined to get frustrated with other people. If the Spirit is within you, you'll be kind. This should be, I guess, one of the most obvious and visible signs of, this, of the Spirit. If you, if you have God's Spirit in your heart, then you'll act with kindness towards other people. If you're acting in unkind ways towards other people, then I think it's reasonable to question whether your actions are being driven by God's Spirit or, or by your own fears. If you've got God's Spirit in you, you'll be generous. You'll be willing to share what you have with others. You won't be selfish. Selfishness these days has become rampant in our world especially in a post-Trumpian world. Donald Trump is possibly one of the most selfish people any of us have ever encountered, certainly in leadership. And he gave permission for an entire nation to behave in a selfish way. He gave permission for a selfish worldview that, that came to prominence in American society. And, and our Canadian exposure to their media has allowed that same spirit of selfishness to grow here in Canada and also elsewhere around the world. He's fed it, he's nourished it, he gave permission to it. There are teachers who teach philosophies of selfishness these days and, and try to make it sound like it's a redeeming quality. Selfishness has come to be understood by many people today as a virtue to be celebrated. It's all about me and what I can get out of life for myself. Live for yourself. There's, there's no one else more worth living for. That's a, a lyric quoted from a, a song by the Canadian band Rush, from, from their song Anthem, which was inspired by a book of the same name, Anthem, by philosopher Anne Rand, who taught a philosophy of selfishness. Look out for number one. That's your goal. That's the dominant view in society today. This whole Karen thing that's erupting online these days that we see blasted across social media is an expression of extreme selfishness. My apologies to any of you out there whose real name is Karen. I didn't start this movement. I didn't name it. It's out there. It's not about you. It's about those fake Karens. That's the name the internet chose for, for these people who always have to have their own way regardless of considerations for other people around them. You hear these days so much talk about my rights, not in the way of protecting what are our legitimate rights and the, our, our best interests in society, but rather people who are putting their own needs and comforts ahead of everyone else. The whole, the whole anti-masker movement, the whole anti-vaxxer movements, they're, they're both symptoms of a culture of selfishness, where I'm going to put my own needs above other people's needs. And if you were to present that argument to people today, 
you'd probably get people applauding it, putting, putting self first. People would be saying, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Why shouldn't I put myself first? What's, what's wrong with that? There's, there's nothing wrong with looking after number one. Except that if you've got the Spirit of God in your heart, a sign of God's Spirit in your heart is that you do not live out of a paradigm of selfishness. You live out of a paradigm of generosity, being generous to others. You give to support the needs of others. You're generous with your time in helping others. You're generous with your financial resources in helping others. You're generous with your use of your talents in helping others and your skills. You'll do anything you can to share what you've got with other people. That's being generous. If God's spirit is in your heart, then people will see faithfulness in your life. They will see you as a person who makes commitments and keeps those commitments. You keep your promises. You don't violate people's trust in you. You're faithful to your commitments. And if you have God's spirit in your heart, people will see gentleness in your life. You will be gentle with others in situations where others might choose words or actions that are harsh or cutting or hurtful. You're going to choose words and actions that are gentle. And finally, people will see self-control in you. You don't fly off the handle in anger. You don't overreact. You're in control of your own actions. Now, again, I want to clarify these are examples. When I say if you have God's spirit in your heart, you'll see these things. I don't mean that you, have to, you necessarily have to exhibit all of them. But you're going to exhibit some of them. If God's spirit rests and resides within you, people are going to see it in things like what I've just been describing. So if I'm going through that list and you hear one and go like, that's not me, I can't do that, I, I just, I can't do that, then that's okay. You still have God's spirit in your heart. Again, these are just examples of the kinds of things that other people will notice in your life when the spirit of God is present in your heart. So again, this list, it's not comprehensive. There, there may be other positive aspects that people see in your life when you are filled with God's Spirit that they're not in this list. So you may have some from the list and missing some from the list, and you may have others that are not in the list. But how do you become Spirit-filled? If you're, if, you're, if you're hearing this and you're thinking about all these, these fruits of the Spirit that you may or may not have, or that you may want to have, if, if you're wanting the spirit in your life and you're feeling like you don't have it right now. How do you become filled with God's spirit? Maybe you're watching this video and you're realizing you've never really felt God's spirit in your heart, but something about this feels appealing to you at a gut level. Whatever this spirit thing is, you want it. Well, you can have it. You can have it just as readily as the rest of us. In fact, it's, it's already there within you. All you have to do is ask God to reveal it in you. Ask God to reveal the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control that are already residing within you or any other qualities like that, that you want to bring out. It, it's, it's, it's not hard. Just ask. Just say, God, please reveal your spirit within me. And then wait for the opportunities to arise where you'll begin to exhibit signs of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and anything else like that. If you don't know God's spirit in your heart, just invite that spirit in now. It's, it's already there. It's waiting for you to, to make room for it in your heart and, and, and then let it, let it shine forth in your life. 
If this message has uh, stirred you to think about you and your relationship with God and, and you want to talk about that, you're invited every Wednesday afternoon at 2 or Wednesday evenings at 7 to join us on Zoom where we discuss these messages in more depth and have a chance to interact with each other and with me and ask questions and talk at a greater depth. So please feel free to join us uh, on Zoom Wednesdays at 2 or 7. Uh, just contact the church office if you need the, uh, the Zoom link information. God bless. In Hebrew, the language of our ancient religious ancestors, the word spirit and the word breath are the same word. And that's why the story of creation describes God breathing life, breathing God's spirit into the first humans. 
And that's where the image of breath in this next song comes from. Breathe on me, breath of God, is a, is a personal prayer asking God to breathe the Spirit into your life. In the message earlier, I, I said that if you have not experienced the Spirit of God in your life and you want to, then just ask God to reveal that Spirit within you. And if you're not sure how to ask, then you can just use the words of this song if you want to. Just, just recite or sing along with this song and ask God to breathe God's breath on you. Breathe on me, breath of God. Receive God's Spirit in your heart. Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fill our hearts now with these virtues and other virtues like them. Let your presence be seen and experienced in our hearts, in the fruits of our hearts. The words and the actions that emanate from our hearts. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until my will is one with thine, to do and to endure. We thank you for the ritual act of remembering you throughout the year. We remember your birth at Christmas. We remember your death on Good Friday. We remember your resurrection on Easter Sunday. We remember the gift of your spirit on Pentecost. And we remember that your spirit is with us now, present within and among us as we gather around this table to celebrate the ritual of remembering that you gave us, the ritual that you gave us, to remember that Jesus' life is given, was given freely for us, to reconnect our lives to your divine, eternal life. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am holy. Holy God of wind and fire, your spirit renews the face of the earth and warms the hearts of your people. We give you thanks for your gifts of Pentecostal power, tongues that utter prophetic words of truth and justice, flames that kindle new visions of compassion and peace, fresh breezes that blow down the walls which separate us from you and one another. And so it is that we join with every voice and tongue on earth and in the heavens to give you praise. We gather at this table to remember that on the night before he died, Jesus ate with his friends. He took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take Eat, this is my body given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. And that same night, Jesus also took a cup and after giving thanks, he passed it to his friends saying, drink. This cup 
poured out for you is the promise of God. Whenever you drink it, remember me. And so we pray, send, O God, your Holy Spirit upon us and upon what we do here, that we and these gifts touched by your Spirit may be signs of life and love to one another and to the world through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Take, eat. Jesus Christ, the true vine. Take, drink. Let us pray together. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world united in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all God's people say together, Amen. Celebrate the Spirit of God in your heart. Celebrate the Spirit of God in your life. Let the fruits of the Spirit be revealed in your words and your actions this week. Words and actions of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God bless, and we'll see you next week.